Good afternoon and welcome to today's inaugural episode of Conversations with Father Bosco, a webinar series sponsored by the Office of Mission and Ministry and the Georgetown University Alumni Association. Thank you for taking time out of your day to connect virtually with fellow Hoyas for today's conversation on the history of the Jesuits with Father John O'Malley. Our host, Father Mark Bosco, is Vice President for Mission and Ministry and holds an appointment in the Department of English. A native of St. Louis, Missouri, Father Bosco joined Georgetown after 14 years at Loyola University, Chicago, where he was a tenured faculty member with a joint appointment in the departments of theology and English. From 2012 through 2017, he also served as director of the Joan and Bill Hank Center for the Catholic Intellectual Heritage at Loyola. As a scholar, Father Bosco has focused much of his work on the intersection of theology and art specifically the British and American Catholic literary tradition. He has published on a number of authors, including the writers Graham Greene and Flannery O'Connor, and the theologian Hans Urs von Balthasar. He is also co-producer -produ and co-director of the film Flannery, which was awarded an NEH grant. I'm Kelly Young, Associate Director of Strategic Engagement and Alumni Relations, and I'll be facilitating today's webinar. Before we get started, I'd like to share a few tips and reminders. This conversation is being recorded. The recording will be made available on our YouTube channel and you will receive the link to the recording in a follow-up email. Father Bosco and Father O'Malley will answer questions at the end of their discussion. Please send, send in your questions as you have them using the questions section of the GoToWebinar control panel. If you're having any technical difficulties or other issues, please also submit those concerns to me via the question section of that control panel. Without any further ado, I'm pleased to turn things over to Father Mark Bosco. Well, thank you, Kelly. And uh, hello, everyone. Hello, Hoyas. Uh, hello, John O'Malley. It's so nice for you to be with us today. It's so good for us to be doing this during this um, uh, shelter in place time, a way for us to connect to the larger community uh, of Hoyas. Uh, and all those uh, who are lovers and friends of Father O'Malley and his work. So uh, let me just introduce John for those who don't know him. Uh, Father John O'Malley has um, uh, uh, been at Georgetown now for 14 years. Um, he's one of the greatest Jesuit scholars in the world. I'm just going to say it out loud. Um, he has honorary doctorates from many universities. He's written 12 important monograph books. He's edited another 12 books, uh, and he's written a countless number of articles. He is 67 years as a teacher of history, including history of the church. Uh, and he's taught generations of students, both Jesuit and lay students. After many years of teaching at the Weston School of Theology, Jesuit School of Theology in Cambridge, uh, Massachusetts, uh, John came to Georgetown, now 14 years ago, and given the title University Professor, it's the most prestigious title the university can give to its professors. Now, as a young Jesuit, uh, I first discovered Father John's work uh, in, uh, in my early life as, an, as a novice. In his seminal work, one of the most important works he's ever done, I think, The First Jesuits. Um, of all of his books, I only have about eight, John, of your books, uh, so I, I still have to get the other four. I'll, I'll make sure I get those. Um, but seriously, Please, yes. <laughs> but that's but seriously, uh, th this book uh, really led to a whole new, um, a whole new almost uh, a discourse in in the study of history. So, so welcome, John. Thank you so much for being with us. I'm delighted to be here. You know, John, as we said, your scholarship, I mean, it's been instrumental in leading to a whole new era, uh, really, of historical and academic inquiry. We sometimes call this Jesuit studies or Jesuitica, the study of all things Jesuit. But you, you were trained as a, an Italian Renaissance scholar. Um, what led you in your studies from Italian Renaissance to a kind of a thorough study of the Jesuit order? Well, I, I began my... Uh sort of academic career uh, as a student of the Italian Renaissance or the Renaissance uh, more, more broadly, that is to say that period in European history in the late 15th, 16th century. And I did my dissertation. It was a subject that was proposed to me by my mentor uh, on a, uh, an Italian thinker, Giles of Viterbo, a Gidio da Viterbo, 
name, his name was Egidio Giles, and he came from the city of Viterbo. And he was a very important Renaissance thinker, but he was also prior general of the Augustinian order and set about trying to reform the order. So the title of my dissertation, finally of my book was Giles of Viterbo on church and reform. So then that led me to also do some little work with Franciscans and Dominicans in that time. So that book helped me when I came to the Jesuits because I came to it with a knowing that the Jesuits just, there wasn't just Christ and then St. Ignatius. <laughs> I knew there were uh, things sure. happened in between and that uh, the Jesuits fit into this larger pattern, which I had a better idea than many people who approached the history of the Jesuits. That was the first thing. Then the second thing was, a second book I wrote was called Praise and Blame in Renaissance Rome. And what it was about was about these sermons that were preached in the Sistine Chapel during this period. And uh, it was a subject that I stumbled upon. I was looking for something else and kept sc scanning some of these sermons and finally stopped dead in my tracks and said, gosh, these are so different from what I'd been led to expect. And so what was, what was, what was different about them? Finally figured out it was the rhetorical form, the literary form, which got me very much into the very essence of the Renaissance, this uh, literary form and this uh, instrument that changed people's ways of thinking. So this helped me understand what the, what the humanistic education was. Mm. And I had a good foil because these sermons were the transition from the medieval form to the present form. So I had this contrast between medieval and Renaissance. So with the Jesuits, I had a much better understanding of why they got into education in the first place and why they bought pretty much hook, line, and sinker the philosophy of education of the humanists. So these uh, Renaissance studies helped me immensely to kind of understand the Jesuits, get into them in a way that other scholars had not been able to do. Oh, that's great. You know, uh, kind of leading into that, John, you know, obviously Ignatius of Loyola and his his companions, uh, they were they were men with um, masters of de master's degrees from Paris. They were um, they wanted to do great things for the church. But I don't think in there, as, as you let us know, education wasn't the was the first thing and foremost on their mind. It was missions. Right. It was special missions uh, that the whatever the pope would put them and dispose them to do. So. You know, you write a lot about this, but maybe in a in a short summary, just because uh, this is really, I think, important to Hoyas. Wh why did the Jesuits get involved in education in the first place? And you know, and what made that engagement so different from what was going on in education at the time? Well, first of all, the they so they the, the first Jesuits, the original ten, they found a basically a missionary order. That's what they were concerned with, and they were almost uh, on principle, not interested in giving lectures and becoming university professors. They had a good education, but it was a clerical education uh, at the University of Paris. So they get to Italy and uh, with the, the spiritual exercises, and one unique thing they brought to the church was the exercises and this whole uh, enthusiasm uh, for formation, I mean, for an in, in, internal change mm -hmm. and through the exercises. And what they, so formation, so in Italy, they just got there and they began to discover that that's precisely what the humanist education was trying to do, was trying to take these young people and form them as ethical, responsible, and uh, people concerned for the common good. And that's what the Jesuits were about, of course, with the added, not just ethical, but with their realization that they were created by God and that this 
they had this mm. other whole dimension to them. So that's what attracted them, it seems to me. And so they started to kind of work with their own men, but then reputation got out and they were asked to open the school in Messina in Sicily. And they found out they were good pedagogues. So it was something they could do, they were trained to do, and it fit right in with what they were all about. So, you know, 15, first school, 1547, 48. By 1552, Ignatius was ready to say, okay, that's our premier mm. ministry. Now we do this in conjunction with our missionary vocation, but it's our premier ministry. Yeah. Yeah. And so, and, th and this was different, the kind of education that would be that Ignatius himself got his education from, right? So what was, what was the difference? What was unique about that moment of starting Jesuit schools? So much so that I think before the, before the end of the 18th century, um, there was something like 800 schools, Jesuit schools in the world, something like that. What was the unique difference then? And that was different, say, than where they went to school at the Sorbonne and the University of Paris? Well, at the University of Paris, these were academics, right? So there were scholastics, right? So what they studied was academic philosophy, mm -hmm. which included just about everything except literature and uh, academic theology. And this was the basic instruction for clerics. Mm -hmm. So uh, that's that was their education. So now they, open these schools and for laymen, lay people. Hmm. And all at once, they, this clerical, these clerical subjects are not a particular interest to them. Uh, they're, they're, these students are going to follow a worldly, a, a secular career. So the Jesuits now had to um, learn these secular subjects like poetry, drama, uh, 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 mathematics, get into oh, what, even get mathematics into, yeah, what, I'm sorry, mathematics and the sciences, I guess, too. Well, yeah, they, they had to get into mathematics and the sciences. So all at once now, the, the Jesuits become a unique kind of cleric. Hmm. Yeah, they had a, uh, a, uh, worldly expertise that was a uh, characteristic of them and now had become really part of their dna so that's how the jesuits were different and their schools now were different and so as i said they they picked up the basic philosophy of the humanists but the humanists were scattered academics or intellectuals here and there all of us the jesuits now had an institution and a network that could make this go yeah. in the yeah. world. Mm. So that was that was a big change. That yeah. more or less answer the question, or not? yeah, yeah, very, very, well, very well. Thank you. You know, uh, there are over two hundred Jesuit universities, college universities in the in the world today, um, but I think a thousand or more regular high schools and another 5,000 affiliated. So let's get back to Georgetown and the Hoya experience. How is Georgetown University, its history as the first Catholic Jesuit institution in the United States, how is it like and unlike all these other Jesuit universities in the country? Or, or in other words, how does Georgetown's founding maybe differ from the founding of other Jesuit schools throughout the 19th and 20th centuries? Well, that's a very good question. I mean, in my opinion, and not only my opinion, but the uh, opinion of other people who have studied this matter, uh, Georgetown's history is unique. First, we take as our founding date 1789. So that's the date of the signing of the Constitution, but also the day of the French Revolution. So uh, that revolution drove back to the United States, John Carroll, the Jesuit. Uh, so what about the founding? So Look, first of all, at the Carroll family. Mm. So they were wealthy, but they were Catholics. And uh, as Catholics, they could not go to school in the colonies. So they had to be sent to Europe to uh, 
get their education. So uh, Char uh, John Carroll's brother um, and his first cousin, Daniel, the brother Daniel's first cousin, Charles, went to the Jesuit school in uh, what today is France, Saint Omer, run by English Jesuits. So they had learned there the uh, pretty much the principles of the Enlightenment. I mean, so toleration, religious liberty, uh, uh, representative form of representative form of government. So when they came back, when John Carroll came back, he founded Georgetown uh, as a school open to students of all faiths. So it was from the beginning, it was a, you might say, <laughs> kind of a pre-ecumenism ecumenical school. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, and uh, it was the Carroll's, so Daniel Carroll signed the Declaration of Independence and Charles Carroll signed the Constitution. This were, these were heroic acts. Yeah. They didn't know that the revolution was going to work, right? They could have lost everything. Um, and John Carroll himself went to uh, Quebec with Benjamin Franklin to try to persuade the French Catholics there, uh, French Canadians, to join in the revolution. So they were big movers and shakers. John Carroll would not accept his appointment as a bishop unless it was approved by his clergy. So mm. uh, this is a very different scenario than the other Jesuit schools. And you know, I'm talking about the United States now, because they were all founded in after the French Revolution. So Europe after the French Revolution was divided into uh, anti-religion, religious parties and conservative ones. So the Jesuits were constantly being expelled and uh, persecuted and so forth. So a lot of the Jesuits who came here were um, uh, refugees. Hmm. And they founded these schools and they found them for Catholics and Catholics who needed a basic education. So they become really much more what we'd say today, confessional schools. Their focus was on Catholics to make them more Catholic and to, uh, uh, you might almost say, confine them to a Catholic situation. So it's a very different, it's a very different scenario. Yeah. So they, so those other schools like Fordham and, and Boston College and St. Louis, those are really kind of more immigrant. Uh, ways of Catholic immigrants coming over, whereas it seems like Georgetown was really about, as you said, it's open to everyone, that there were Catholics, there were Jews, there were others, uh, there were people of different faith already kind of built into the DNA of, of, of our of this university. It's, it's astonishing that it's so early. Right, but it's, uh, it's very much a creature of the Enlightenment. As a matter of fact, one of the faculty members here calls it, Georgetown's basically found it as an Enlightenment institution. I know that might be a little exaggeration, but uh, Anyhow, uh, yeah, it's it's it's, it's interesting. It's uh, is there any piece of um, Jesuit history um, that you think needs to be discussed or studied more? That that just you think either is just really provocative, or that you really think is really important to understanding what it means to be part of a Jesuit education, part part to be part of this legacy. Is there any historical kind of aspects that you wish? Oh, if I had another fifty years of this is where I would kind of move. To kind of uh, create more um, conversation around that could help us. Well, I don't know uh, <laughs> about the next 50 years and creating more conversation, but the uh, uh, the one aspect of Jesuit history that I think is not appreciated and uh, by Jesuits and maybe better appreciated by people who are not Jesuit is the what happened to the order. When, with the founding of the schools. So first of all, the obvious thing, they became educators and they began to staff and run these institutions and uh, that became you know, part of their DNA. But the deeper thing is, which I've mentioned already, is it changed the order. Wow. They now had a different uh, DNA. They were clerics and they had a, the clerical background of philosophy and theology, but they had something more. They had a worldly expertise. Mm -hmm. And you want to explain why um, Matteo Ricci in China was able to uh, make his way into the imperial court there 
it wasn't because he knew philosophy and theology, but because he could knew literature. Mm. And then the Jesuits who followed, they succeeded because they knew astronomy, they knew cartography. Uh, so that was, the, and I mean, uh, Gerard Manley Hopkins could have happened in any order, but he happened to happen happened in the Jesuit order. Yeah, the great uh, poet, the great 19th uh, century poet, sure. Yeah. yeah. So uh, that's the, the thing that I think really needs mm. to be emphasized. And so what is the Jesuit spirit? What is the Jesuit charism? Well, it's certainly Ignatian spirituality. It's the, the spirituality that grows out of the spiritual exercises. But plus that is this other aspect of having one foot in the church and one foot in the world. Hmm. All those yeah. jokes you hear about uh, <laughs> Franciscans, Jesuits, Franciscans, and Dominicans. The Jesuits always end up giving some a very worldly answer, you know, what school are you going to send your son to, Jesus, Church for Mary, that sort of thing. Well, yeah. they're right on. They're right yeah. on. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, you know, there is a real sense that there is a Jesuit kind of charism that uh, is, is both given you know, by God to us and, and as a grace to the church. And I think it, one of the things that I wanted to ask you, as a, as a someone who's lived in this uh, as a Jesuit for so many years and has studied it, um, we have had this like um, revolution over the last 50 years about Ignatian spirituality, about what it's about, about how it can serve uh, as a real, as a, as a journey, as a way into to a deeper relationship with God. Um, how did it, how did that, did, did, did Ignatius' spiritual exercises get approbated pretty easily? And, and what do you, what do you think of the whole history of the, of the spiritual exercises as a really, as we share it more and more with our, our students, with our staff, our faculty, with our alumni, um, what is it about Jesuit spirituality um, that you think is, is again, provocative or so unique that it kind of speaks to us today? Well, I'm always sort of surprised, pleasantly surprised at people who've been Catholic for many years and they, they make the 19th annotation, they treat that uh, spiritual exercise in daily life and how they say it transformed them and gave them a new uh, appreciation for what it means to be a, a Christian and a believer and a Catholic. So what is it? Well, I think it's so easy with religion to sort of go through motions and to learn rote answers and not to take time to step back and to try to better understand what's going on within yourself and how God is speaking to you uh, through what's going on in yourself. And that's what the exercises are especially designed to do and do do. And so it gives people a, a much better sense of what they are and who they are and God's presence to them in a very vivid way. Uh, so, and that's been, now that's, that's always been, I think the case with the spiritual exercises. But what we've learned in the last 50 years, I, a little commercial here, I have an article coming out uh, <laughs> in the fall <laughs> on this very issue. So uh, stay tuned. Uh, and, uh, but we were able to recover much more of the history and of the uh, uh, original inspiration of it. that was lost simply because people didn't have the documents to, uh, hmm. to to discover what was there. Yeah, yeah. Um, I think one of the great things that uh, Georgetown has been able to do is uh, have a you know have a uh, Ignatian program uh, for students, for faculty, in our Ignatian retreats. And um, I do think that it's been a way for for students who have different kinds of commitments to either organized religion, the Catholic Church, or otherwise. But there just seems to be a way to to invite as many folks uh, in who are who are seekers who are trying to find that that's that's place that you talk about. Um, it's been an amazing kind of I guess um, evangelization tool because it it doesn't come off cross like it's 
trying to coerce or force a kind of a way of being, right? And I think that must have been part of the flavor of why people were attracted to Ignatius uh, and his, his companions and, and why uh, we still continue to run retreat, house, retreat houses and stuff like that around the country, huh? Yes, absolutely, yeah. No, I'm amazed at, oh, well, not amazed, but I'm, I guess I'm pleased and so forth to see how the, uh, the exercises, are, I mean, they're really geared for Catholics. I mean, there's no doubt about that, but the, uh, uh, they're much more open Mm -hmm. And you don't have to be a member of the Catholic Church, even the Christian Church, to sort of follow at least some of the basic uh, directions of the exercises. And and you know, yeah, no, no, I put you on your way, right? Yeah, yeah. yeah. You know, I, I was asked by a, a a Jewish historian if I would lead her in the exercises once, and I was like. I was like, really? Um, and it was, I think I learned <laughs> and, and went on a journey just as much as she did, having to try to find that space within the exercises where we met to talk about the spiritual life with somebody who was a, a, a historian of Jew, Jewish medieval thought, you know? So it's been, it's been quite a, it's been quite wonderful. You know, I wanna kind of turn it to maybe a little more contemporary stuff. Pope Francis, right? Our, the first uh, the first Jesuit Pope, um, uh, what do you, what is your sense of him? Why why historically is he the first one? Why weren't there other Jesuit popes? And what do you? <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, in general, there have been relatively few popes from religious orders. Hmm. Uh, then, so that's one thing. Secondly, you know, we have this rule about the Jesuits are not supposed to become bishops. Now, that was never there was always exception for missionary countries, and then. It just has kind of got battered uh, in, in the present. So there are a fair number of Jesuit bishops. So that's the pool from which cardinals come and from which the popes come. So that's another thing. There just have not been very many. So, uh, but also, the Society of Jesus has been a very controversial order in the church. And uh, the, uh, you know, do, do you really want a Jesuit pope? Uh, you don't know. <laughs> don't know what he might have up his sleeve. So uh, I think that that's been one of the factors. Uh, and uh, yeah, we, we never expected to have a Pope, right. a Jesuit Pope. Right. And the, the election of Francis was a total surprise to the order. I totally. remember, I remember when I was asked in, uh, I was coming out of a, a building at school and and a, and a TV reporter, I just found this out, and a TV reporter put like a, a, a microphone in my face and the camera and says, well, what do you think about this? You're a Jesuit. And I, and I think I said something like, well, we work for Jesuit. We work for popes. We don't become them. <laughs> you know, so it was a really sense of a, a kind of a disconnect for the first couple of weeks, first couple of months of having, even for a Jesuit, for having a pope uh, who is Jesuit. Absolutely. Yeah. 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 What do you think of him? What and do I you must say that Please. Pope Francis and and our fathers general have been very careful about keeping the line clear that, uh, you know, the Pope's the Pope and we're a religious order and, you know, that the two things are different. So even though I, he was a general. I, I think it's important to even maybe say technically, the, when Pope Francis became a bishop, he technically had to leave the jurisdiction of the Jesuits, right? He's no longer under obedience to the general. And so he's inspired, he's Jesuit trained, he's a Jesuit through and through, but technically he's not a Jesuit right now, right? Absolutely, yeah. Okay. You cannot be a bishop and be a Jesuit because okay. you cannot observe the vow of poverty and you cannot observe the vow of obedience. Okay. So you cannot be a Jesuit. Yeah. What do you see about this Pope though that is, in your uh, estimation, just, you know, the Jesuit sense or the Ignatian sensibility? Where do you see that mostly in his, his pontificate? Well, I see it in many ways and some, you know, sort of uh, little side. Since he talks about going to the periphery, right? Mm -hmm. Going to the margins. Well, he picks that up from the Jesuit general congregations and being a member of the society. Um, I see him as, uh, you know, uh, uh, I guess the simplicity of his approach to his own life mm. and then his simplicity really of his spirituality that he tries to uh, 
in part and and to and to teach and to exemplify so uh, i see him very much uh, very much as you know, when he said you know uh, that i'm i'm a sinner well, he picks that right up from general congregation 32 decree 2 yeah what is a jesuit jesuit is a sinner so uh, i just see so many clues also i mean i see him as a person who really understood or understands and appreciates appropriates the second vatican council yeah 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 which might be a good segue for us because you know most of your scholarship at georgetown if i'm correct you can you i'm sure you'll correct me if i'm wrong over this last decade it's really been about the right. import <laughs> the importance of the councils uh, of the church uh, not only for us to understand those so trent vatican one we have vatican uh, trent and all that we have Vatican II, we have uh, th this this new book. So these are books that you've published while you've been at Georgetown. Um, what? The, why are these so important uh, to engage in our present moment? Or in other words, what can we learn from these councils as we can kind of move forward and through the papacy of Pope Francis uh, and, and really the church in the future? What do you think, what, what are you trying well, to do? I mean, what am I trying to do? <laughs> <laughs> the, uh, uh, what I'm trying to do is to kind of beat it into Catholics that uh, they need to understand the history of the church because uh, we are the result of, uh, we are what we are because of our past. So the past is never dead, it's not even past, it's living in us. My mother and father are living in me today. Uh, so mm -hmm. if you want to understand what's going on today in the church, you'd better understand how we got to be where we are. And that's what I try to do in the book. That's what I, why I think history is important. So uh, this is, you know, the and so why the councils? Well, first of all, they are the highest and most important authority in the church when they're conducted in communion with the Roman pontiff. So there's nothing bigger or better or more important. And so if you want to understand Catholicism, you can pick up the uh, uh, catechism of the Catholic Church a lot of abstract answers to abstract questions. Hmm. That's important to learn that. You wonder hmm. what the church really is and how it operates and what's going on, get into its history. And these two councils are the great turning points and that their impact is simply Im immeasurable. So it's the way to be Catholic. Uh, and hmm. I must say that the ignorance of church history on the part of Catholics is a sin. <laughs> Cry to heaven for vengeance. <laughs> Spoken like a true historian. <laughs> I can't help it. Yeah, right. No, it's true. Um, no, the council and, and, and our students today are obviously children uh, that have been born out of that council and their parents have most likely. A lot of our alumni uh, transition and had to to just kind of go through that 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 in their, themselves. That's from Vatican from a Vatican One Trinitine liturgy to uh, the new liturgy and stuff. So it definitely is it's, it, it is the life of the Church really is played out in those councils and what we say we who we are and how we are together. Well, I mean, I really feel with, with Vatican Two. I mean, it's so easy to trivialize the council that you know the. The priest said mass in English now and turned the altar around. I mean, that just trivializes the whole council. You want to know a big thing the council did? It gave the Catholic Church and it gave especially the popes a brand new ministry, ministry of being a reconciliation among the religions of the world. Mm -hmm. And uh, Paul VI, John Paul II, Benedict XVI, and now Pope Francis. There are great uh, wow. people trying to reconcile uh, different religions, which tell me. Tell me how badly that's needed in the world today. Yeah. yeah. Right? Wow. Yeah. No, that's true. That. Yeah. And that's a profound ministry now that the, that 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 the Roman Pontiff does. That's true. You know, um, it's something that our viewers probably don't realize. Um, but you know, Georgetown University uh, has a wonderful track record when it comes to vocations to the Jesuits to the Society of Jesus. I think we've had a young man enter the Jesuits almost every single year of the last 16 years. And so something's going on at Georgetown in terms of its intellectual and its um, devotional life. Uh, what do you think, given your position and what you've seen in the world, 
What do you think attracts these young Hoyas to the Society of Jesus? Or just what, 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 what do you think is still attractive to young people to the Society of Jesus? Well, I don't know. I don't, it's a hard question to answer. Uh, but of course, I'll take a stab at it. <laughs> I think that the, we, so we have this program here, as you know, of, that run by Father Chris Steck and Father uh, Dave Collins of inviting young men who would be interested in uh, joining the Jesuits or the Austin priesthood or religious life to come and just kind of join in a formal way. And they have a, uh, once a month they meet and they have mass with the Jesuit community. And then afterwards they uh, go to uh, Father Chris Steck's apartment where he cooks dinner for them. But they always bring with them a Jesuit, another Jesuit, and they bring him somebody sort of uh, exotic. I mean, an international Jesuit or Jesuit who's in a strange field and so forth. And I think that that uh, all at once the these young men see that, gosh, being a priest. I mean, it's a broader thing. Could be a broader thing than mm -hmm. simply parish work, and see how active these Jesuits are in the world, you might say. Mm -hmm. I think that's a that's mm -hmm. a factor. Uh, and I want to say too that not only do we have one or two entering the society from here every year, but they stay. <laughs> yes. They, no, that's they, true. They enter and they stay. And that's yeah. the important thing. Yeah. No, there it's an impressive group. It's an it's, it's an impressive legacy that we have going on here. Um yeah. Um, so just a couple more questions before we open it up to others. Uh, what is, you know, we're now here in this moment of of pandemic, um, and and yet we are like the most connected. We are like the the global, uh, you know, network of the church, you might say, the Jesuits. So in, in an age of global connection, um, and yet this intense moment of isolation that we're all kind of feeling, we're taking, finishing classes on Zoom, having to, to telework. Um, we, what can we learn from those first Jesuits who stayed connected and really found their purpose, even though they were very far away from each other, they were very much located all over the globe. Um, is there anything we can learn from the first Jesuits, our founders, uh, in this moment of, of isolation and pandemic? Well, I don't know. I mean, I think that we're doing in our own environment or our own the thing, facilities we have at our disposal, essentially what they were doing. We're sure, Jesuits are certainly not the only ones doing this, but connecting through the internet and all these other things. What's remarkable about the early Jesuits, another thing that's remarkable about them, is the way they stayed connected. And one reason for that was that from the very beginning, they were, Jesuits were forced to write periodically to the central office in Rome. And to, so rectors had to do that and some designated people from every community had to do that. This meant that the Jesuit community, that the, the general was probably the best informed person in the church about what was going on out in the trenches. And then they summarized those letters and sent information around so that the Jesuits knew what was going on elsewhere. Also for the schools, the missionaries wrote back and sent back information to the schools about these exotic places to the schools. And so I'm just saying that, you know, networking and keeping in touch was a, a very crucial part of the Jesuit uh, way of proceeding from the very beginning and helps explain the coherence in the society despite the dispersal over every in every country of the world with all kinds of different enterprises going on yeah i remember reading uh when i was in a, a course uh in theology about the, the some of these letters and, and there's a lot of examples you know Z xavier's letters to ignatius and the deep deep you know law sense of loss but also love and friendship that was displayed um or the letters of uh, Aloysius Gonzaga's father to the general, you know, say, take care of my boy. And, you know, this kind of, it, it was, there's just so many beautiful letters. How many, like, didn't Ignatius have like five, right? Or have corresponded 5,000 times or something in his lifetime as, as the Jesuit general? 
He has the largest single correspondence of any 16th century figure that includes Erasmus, Luther, wow. and so forth. So it's over 7,000. Oh, wow. Now, wow. Um, a lot of these are, you know, remember to bring home the salt tonight, honey, you know, that sort of letter. I mean, uh, nothing, nothing very earth shaking, but others are much more important and, you know, give you a pretty, very good idea into, into Ignatius as a spiritual leader and as a first rate administrator. And so, uh, uh, no, they, so that's a, that's a good example. And then he, he had this <clears throat> wonderful secretary, Polanco, who uh, you know helped write a lot of the letters and actually wrote them. Ignatius would say, you know, Polanco, write to the dear Polanco, write to them about this. And Polanco would write the letter. So some of those letters of Ignatius are really letters from Polanco, but nonetheless, they originated from Ignatius. Yeah, or dictated from. That's cool. That's cool. Um, one more question then before we kind of open it up to others, and and I certainly could always ask more questions, but let's. But you know, um, we have so many collaborators today in the Society of Jesus and our ministries and our apostolates. I, there's a real sense that, especially even in our own language as a Jesuit order, we talk about our colleagues and our, our as 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 really uh, people who carry and sometimes hold the Society of Jesus's mission for us. A great example, of course, is our own president, uh, DeJoya, a layman who is the director of a Jesuit work. Uh, um, and, you know, there's a lot of a lot of talk and a lot of people who are so engaged with our spirituality and want to be attached. And a lot of orders like the Dominicans, the Benedictines and the Franciscans, they have what they call the third order. And um, someone recently asked me um, about, you know, was there ever a possibility of a third order? of kind of, of connection in the society, a more formalized attachment. And, you know, I, I, I think I know what you're going to say, but, you know, what is your personal opinion on this? Uh, why do you think it is or will or could not happen? And, and what's the reasons for that? <laughs> well, the first thing to say is we've got one. <laughs> we do. We do, yes. It's called Christian Life Communities. Yeah, that's true. Now, now Christian Life Communities are a refashioning of the old Sodality of Our Lady, and they were refashioned about 80 years ago. And they've been extremely successful in some countries, but they have never been able to fly in the United States. Mm -hmm. A lot of efforts were made here in the 1940s and 1950s to get some of them going, and they would for a short while, and then they didn't go anyplace. So I think that's the first thing to say. Uh, so the second thing to say is, Third order, yeah, be careful, uh, because what are going to be the lines of demarcation? I mean, I think the Dominicans and Franciscans have done this very well. So, say so the first thing is you want to want to start something new. That the Christian life community is not good enough for you. <laughs> uh, then uh, uh, study the way the Dominicans and Franciscans dealt uh, organize these things because. One problem is, you know, as you know, one of the American provinces some years ago tried to, you know, really have these closely affiliated members uh, who were lay people, married people, and so forth, get into all kinds of problems, mm. and uh, and it's sort of ugly. So mm. I think it's a it's a path to go down, uh, but carefully, so that yeah. everybody nobody gets hurt. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, in my I come back to what I said, we've got one. Just, yeah, no, no, that's true. That is true. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. I do think it, what I love about um, our, our universities, I certainly love about Georgetown, is um, there's this invitation always to um, share in not only the spiritual you know, heritage of the Society of Jesus and to ground our school, but really to feel like they, that you can own it, that these are the tools of your own vocation as a as a nurse or as a philosopher or as a uh, Arabic professor or as a you know public policy person. So there is this sense about that that um, and I always thought to myself the third order well maybe because we because the because the glue is the spiritual exercises and that it always that invitation to to collaborate that in some ways it, it kind of uh, serves yeah. in some no, way. I, 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 I'm, I'm not against it at all. I mean, I'm for it, but uh, I think you need to be careful how to do it. No, I, I agree with you completely. Yeah. Good. 
Good. Well, listen, thanks, John. So let's, let's ask Kelly to come back and she said that maybe there'd be some questions that are coming from some of our viewers. Kelly? Yes, we've gotten a number of questions for you, Father O'Malley. Um, so to start, here's one from um, an attendee. The Father General, Arturo Sosa, has identified reconciliation as a particular responsibility of Jesuit schools worldwide today. What is the role of Jesuit higher education and particularly Georgetown in the work of reconciliation? Well, I think, you know, this has been a, again, just what we were talking about with uh, Pope Francis and the other popes about after the Second Vatican Council, the reconciliation. If you, if you really study Vatican II, it's basically a council of reconciliation of all, all things. So what about Georgetown? Well, Georgetown has been engaged in this in different ways. First of all, uh, well, right here with, within uh, on, on the hilltop, uh, our doctoral program in, in theology, the only doctoral program we have is in interreligious dialogue. So that's a, a program in interreligious uh, reconciliation, right? Uh, so that's one thing. And then, well, Mark, you, what are you, you've got some other things that uh, the... Uh... In terms of reconciliation? Yeah. Well, I do think, you know, uh, trying to bring, uh, to, to make public policy, bringing the polarized um, uh, kind of uh, discourses in our country here in DC together, I've been impressed with um, how Georgetown specifically, but really higher, but our Jesuit higher education has tried to be a kind of a, a sanctuary, as Father Howard Gray used to say, to bring people together so that they could speak uh, and, and listen to each other um, is another one. Um, but don't you think, I think, I think Georgetown's done that really well. And I think that most of our higher ed institutions have tried to become spaces of reconciliation uh, there. Right, uh, I think that uh, uh, President DeJoy has been wonderful in that regard. I mean. First of all, he, he reconciliation in terms of how he's uh, dealt with other universities. He's on, often called in as a consultant and so forth for some of their issues and problems. And at the same time, has given an example of how a university can be uh, uh, not simple. I mean, beyond training professionals, we have a higher call we're trying trying to instill into the students yeah. and, and graduates that yeah. there's more going on here yeah i've been impressed too with the real trying to bring together questions of justice and reconciliation together so that sometimes i think in the past we've kind of thought that these were two different things but i think certainly pope francis and archbishop uh, and, and, and father general sosa really sees justice and reconciliation as kind of wedded uh, that is, you just can't do what's legally just. You have to reconcile and and and, and come together. Yes. Next, Next question. <laughs> <laughs> that was a good one. <laughs> Kelly. Yes. Um. So you you do have a question from a former student, Jonathan Morrow. Uh, could you discuss how the Jesuits changed from the first Vatican Council in the beginning of the 20th century to the end of the 20th century? Did the Society of Jesus change more than any other religious order of the church in that time period? Mm. Yeah, well, I think you can say that, yes, we changed more than any other religious order because we are so coherent in, I mean, so so careful communication and so forth. So there, there are differences among the Jesuit provinces, but compared with the other religious orders, they're minimal. And so the society tends to move kind of corporately in a certain direction. And that's not necessarily true of the other religious orders. The Dominicans are a good example. They're much more uh, province centered. And so you get these really kind of striking differences between one province and the other, and uh, actually in terms of this movement from the 19th century into the 21st century. So why did this happen? How did this happen? Well, it happened uh, through the influence of Vatican Council, but the Vatican Council came out of the scholarship that was going on before the Council. Most, Much of it 
by Jesuits. So that uh, the, uh, the Society of Jesus, for instance, by, by the time of the council, uh, much of the Society of Jesus had moved out of the uh, uh, anti-world uh, and anti-modern world mentality of the 19th century of the Catholic Church, because the world was so anti-Catholic. Uh, and moreover, the world itself had changed after the Second World War. So the Holocaust and this um, horrid, bloodiest half century in the history of the world made everybody stop back and think, well, maybe uh, we need to change our ways of thinking and our way of being and our way of relating to one another. So it goes back to this whole question of you know, reconciliation. So uh, yes, I think that society of Jesus has changed and it's changed partly because the times have changed. So we have, it's not the same anti-Catholic, I mean, a lot of anti-Catholicism out there and anti-Christian stuff out there, but it's not the same sort of um, in in the West and uh, uh, studied anti-Christian mm -hmm. situations as it was before. And I do think, John, just to kind of continue that question, maybe I mean, yeah, I remember being a young kid hearing that the Jesuits, you know, were the paratroopers for the Pope, and they were like kind of this this almost like vanguard of like Navy SEALs. Um, of course, that was the rhetoric of a kind of church that was fighting the modern world, right? And it was kind of protecting the Vatican and protecting the Pope from a world that thought it was, you know, archaic or something or, or, or wanted to overthrow it. And then, of course, we get uh, Pedro Rupe uh, and we get, a, we get a whole new kind of engagement with the world. And, you know, it's very rare that you ever hear that kind of language about the Society of Jesus anymore. Um, and if it is, it's usually as a joke, because in many ways we don't see ourselves anymore as these kinds of like, I mean, I think there's a militant, military kind of structure to us, but we don't see ourselves really in that way anymore. Is that right? Well, that yes, in a sense, we never, we never did. I mean, uh, there was a, this was in the 1940s, I guess, or 50s, there was this Broadway play that was later made into a music, uh, a movie, and it was about the Jesuits. And uh, so, uh, was shown to us uh, when we were uh, in in studies, and we just we laughed all the way through it because uh, the superior would say, "I command you to you know go do this." But we never heard that in our lives in the Society of Jesus. So yeah, so it was partly a a caricature, a character that we sometimes help foster, but uh, it was a character that never really. Um, describe the society as it was. Great, thanks. What's next, Kelly? So drawing on the lessons um, lessons from the history of the Jesuits, what advice, Father O'Malley, do you have for the future of the Jesuits and Jesuit educational institutions? <laughs> okay, good. <laughs> <laughs> My first advice is study your history and understand it and then act accordingly. That would be my pithy answer to that question. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, or, or yeah, what's what's I'm not a historian, but what's the great quote about history? If you don't study history, it, will, it continues to repeat itself. Repeat itself, yeah. So yeah. it's going to repeat itself anyway. But uh, you, you don't want to, you don't want to sort of know the past and deliberately make the same mistakes that were made in the past. So that's one, you don't understand history, that, that's one of the pitfalls. But the big reason you study history is to find out who you are. Hmm. That's you a pretty nice, pretty interesting thing to do, pretty important thing to do. I mean, history is our corporate memory. Right. Uh, if you don't, if you lose your memory, you don't know who you are. You have Alzheimer's, you have corporate Alzheimer's. So you yeah. keep reinventing the wheel and so on and so forth. You, you know, it's not yeah. good. Very good. Very good. Kelly, another one? So on a I want the easy one. 
Okay, I think this one might be easier. Uh, on a personal note, Father O'Malley, why did you choose the Jesuit order as opposed to one of the other orders of priesthood? I didn't know what I was doing. <laughs> and that's, as a matter of fact, is partly true. Uh, I grew up in this small town and the only priest I knew was our parish priest. And I thought I've had a vocation and wanted to, wanted to be a priest, but I knew I did not want to be a parish priest. And I, so I was a great reader and read about the Jesuits and read that they were uh, teachers and they were missionaries. And both of those appealed to me. And I had, we had a little Jesuit lore in the family. Uh, but my mother went to a school where they often have retreats by Jesuits. So, uh, but I never met a Jesuit. So, but that was, I think what attracted me, a simply very superficial thing. Uh, I just didn't know anything. I'd read a lot of matter of fact about the Trappists. I never felt attracted to the Trappists, but I was very fascinated by their history. And, uh, 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 but, and I must say that when I entered the novitiate, I was kind of parachuting in from outer space. Uh, I didn't know anybody. Many of the other novices with me had gone to Jesuit schools and had some classmates and so forth in a common lingo. I had none of that. And uh, so for the first couple of days, I really felt disoriented and is this the thing for me? Uh, but then within an extremely short time, I just felt at home. Mm. I said, no, this is, this is it. Uh, and I've never, it's not always been easy, but I, I've never really wavered in that all these years. So <laughs> God writes straight with crooked lines. Yeah. My Henry the Jesuit was one of the crookedest lines you'll ever see in your life. <laughs> I think a lot of Jesuits would say the same thing, John, right? It's been really the, the way that God right. works in our lives. It's amazing. Yeah. So that's cool. Uh, hey, Kelly, another one? I think we have time for one more, don't we? We do. We do have time for one more question. Um, I think this one might be another another fun one. I hope it doesn't stump you. Um, but who is one historical Jesuit figure that isn't well known that you wish people knew more about, Father O'Malley? Hmm. Um, well, let me see. Um, well, OK. Domenico Zippoli. Ah. Zippoli was a musician in the 17th century in Rome. He was the organist of St. John Lateran and he joined the Jesuits. He was also a composer. He joined the Jesuits and wanted to be a missionary and was sent to Spanish America, uh, basically Argent present day Argentina, I, I think, is where he hang out, hung out. And he wrote music for the indigenous people. And uh, this was, was you know, little, little operas and so forth. And uh, uh, he, he really is an extraordinary person. He died very young. He died, died as a scholastic. He was never ordained, um, but done, died young, young, as a, young in the society. So he's a person I'd really like to see people know more about him. Matter of fact, this little community I belong to in Cambridge, Massachusetts, there were nine of us, and we decided we'd name our community Zippoli House to try to, you know, promote him a little bit. So again, again, he illustrates this thing about the Jesuits as a worldly uh, expertise in, in, in skills that you don't normally expect a priest to have. Wow, that's fantastic. Yeah, I think we have some faculty even here who are doing studies of Zippoli and uh, and they're going into archives throughout South America, trying to um, to find some of these um, scores, musical scores, and and performing them. It's just it's really yes, right. there's a bunch of them. There's a bunch of them that have been founded and and are, are being performed. Yeah, it's amazing. Well, Father O'Malley, this has been a great pleasure for me. It's always a pleasure to be with you in Jesuit community. Uh, it's always a great pleasure for you to be with our faculty, talking about Jesuit history and about education. Uh, and I think it's been a wonderful opportunity for our alumni, our students and faculty. Uh, 
to get a little bit of who you are and your expertise. And so I really appreciate you uh, having this conversation with us today. Well, it's been a pleasure for me. I love to talk about this stuff. <laughs> Very good. Well, listen, I hope that if, folks, you can join us. Uh, the next time we meet for conversations, we're going to have our own Father Otto Hentz, and we're going to talk about um, the whole history of the problem of God and some of the, the issues that he sees going on. And so uh, another Jesuit uh, of great love, who's greatly loved like Father O'Malley uh, here at Georgetown. So thanks for joining us and uh, we'll see you next time.